Hey guys, this is Nick here at the Super Trader. I've got something really great for you today. Jack Swagger, he's famous for interviewing the best traders in the world. He was the author of all of the Market Wizard series. Well, he's done it again. In this extremely rare footage, Jack Swagger reveals some of the greatest insights that he gained while he was interviewing some of the top traders in the world, including one who took his personal account from $30,000 to a staggering $80 million, and another famous hedge fund manager who averaged 25% per month for decades. This exclusive footage has been said to be one of the most important videos about trading you could ever watch, and I've got to agree with that. I just want to let you know that this footage is about 50 minutes in duration. I know that that's not something that uh, everybody has 50 minutes right now to watch it, but uh, if you don't, bookmark this page right now and watch it later today. Okay, Don't let 24 hours go by without watching this incredible training. And after you've watched the training, I'd really appreciate it if you just share at least one insight that you personally gained in the comment section below the video. That'll help all of us learn from one another and you, know, you may pick up something that somebody else doesn't and, and that really helps us all to learn from each other and, and become better as traders together. And now without further ado, enjoy this incredible trading. Until next time, trade super. Jack Schwaker, renowned Market Wizards author and Traders Hall of Fame award winner, presents The Winning Methods of the Market Wizards, a powerful workshop highlighting the most common traits and techniques of the super traders. Thank you. It's great to be in front of a crowd of which is almost pure traders, I would assume. I, uh, first thing I want to say, even though most of your traders, I, I assume probably a lot of people here do something else in their for the regular profession, also probably some spouses got dragged along unwillingly. So to, to make this talk relevant, I can assure you that all the points I'm going to talk about, really all the points, apply not only to success in trading, but to success in general. So that's the first thing. Now we'll start out with what's not important, because people um, think that trading has to do with some sort of secret formula, some magic, uh, whether it's Elliot or Gann or anybody else, you find a formula and you'll get rich. And that's what, that's what success in the markets is about. And I think it's really a very wrong way of looking at it. And let me illustrate it by giving you a couple of examples to, to make it absolutely clear. We'll take some individuals. First, we'll start with Jim Rogers. Most of you, I assume, know Jim Rogers, the fellow with the bow tie. I uh, used to work with George Soros running the Quantum Fund back in the 70s. It was the most successful fund at the time. Uh, he quit because he got tired of the management aspect. He's been investing his own money for the past couple of decades very successfully. Um, brilliant guy. If you read my interview with him back, which was done now about 13 years ago, all of his projections were exactly right. He was talking about the top of the Japanese stock market uh, right before it topped. He talked about it going down, the Nikkei going down from 30,000 plus at the time. He said it would go down to 10,000. Exact, I mean, incredible projection. He talked about gold at the time going down for the next 10 years. Every projection you look at, he was exactly on. Okay, so he's basically a fundamental analyst, but I asked him, Jim, you ever look at charts? And he says, you know, well, like he's admitting a sin. He says, you mean if I just look at it just to see where the market's been? Yeah, I'll look at it. But do I believe in any of this head and shoulders, mumbo jumbo garbage? No, it's all, it's all nonsense. And, and he says, you know, you know I've, I've, I've never met a rich technician and then he pauses to be cute. He says, unless you count the ones that sell their services. So I don't know if you can get more cynical. <laughs> I don't know if you can get more cynical about technical analysis than Jim Rogers. And for Jim, short-term trades like two years. OK, that's one side. Other side of the fence, uh, take Marty Schwartz, who's a stock, a stock index trader. I interviewed Schwartz. Uh, it happened to be coincidentally just the time he was putting together a track record. Now, a lot of these traders, they trade their own money, kind of you don't actually get the luxury of having their track record per se. In this case, he was thinking of matching public money, so he had to have a, a, an audit to track record put together. She gave me his 10 year track record when I was doing, you know, before I did the interview. And over that 10 year period, uh, Marty had compiled an average return of 25%. Now, I, when usually I say that, the audience doesn't seem to be very impressed. So let me clarify that. 25% per month. All right. All right. Now, now, now I've got your interest. Okay. Now, now, some of the quantitatively oriented people in the audience are going, 
wait, 25 cents a month, how come he didn't own half the US JNP? Right? That's, that really compounds. Well, Marty's father went through the Depression and instilled in his son a great fear of things going wrong. So Marty, even though, and this is, you can go back, you look at these, he was doing these trading contests with real money, not these hypothetical contests. He's putting in $400,000, turning it into $1.2 million in four months, going back, putting the profits in T-bills, going back to four hundred. and he kept on doing that for 10 years. He kept on going from four hundred up to over a million and back down to four hundred, and kept on putting the money into in T-bills because he had, he had this fear of something going wrong. So uh, that's why he still made a lot of money, but it didn't compound to God knows how much. Anyway. Monty, talking about technical analysis, is paraphrasing people uh, like Jim Rogers. And he says, I never met a rich technician. You know, what a stupid, arrogant type of attitude. He says, I spent 10 years on Wall Street as a fundamental analyst. I lost money every year, and I got rich as a technician. So you really can't get much, much more different than that. And I'll give you another, another slant like Marty Schwartz. And this is a fellow by the name of Ed Sakota, who would be totally unknown were it not for my first book. I mean, I had never heard of him. The way I found Ed Sakota was uh, there was a fellow by the name, also not a well-known, not a, not a completely unknown person, not, not only well-known, Michael Marcus, who's a very private individual trader, who I happen to know uh, actually just by, again, by coincidence, my first job in Wall Street as a research analyst happened to be this job slot he was vacating. And uh, so we met, we became friends, we kept in touch. And so years later when I was doing the book, um, uh, I, I asked him to do the interview. Why did I ask him to do the interview? Because, well, he went off to be a trader. He went to Commodity Corp. They gave him a $30,000 account. Ten years later, it was $80 million. So that's why I asked him to do the interview. Now, so, so that's a pretty impressive record. And, and he was really reluctant to do the interview. And finally, he was able to convince him to do it. And I went, I flew out to California and interviewed him. Spent the day at his house. We really interviewed all day long. And after dinner, kind of, he pushes back his chair. Uh, and he says, you know, this really wasn't bad. You know, it's kind of a cathartic experience. And he says, you know who you should interview? You should interview Ed Sakota. I said, Ed who? He said, Ed Sakota. I said, who, who's Ed Sakota? Well, he said, Ed is the best trader I know. Now, if you're doing a book on traders, and some fellow who's turned 30,000 to 80 million is telling you about the best trader he knows, obviously you're interested. So I said, well, can I, can I speak to him? So he says, well, you know, sure. So he calls, he calls Ed and talks to Ed and gives me the phone. I was supposed to head back to New York, but you know, Ed agrees to do the interview, so I, I, I say, well, I'll change my plans, I fly out to Nevada. And um, I, my original intention was to actually get back the same day, but it turns out I ended up spending the night there and just talking to him all evening. But in any case, Ed Dakota and I kind of see each other every, you know, every number of years, we end up in the same place. And back about five years ago, we were both in Chicago. At the same time, we had dinner together, and he was telling me tongue in cheek about a dinner he had the previous evening with a fundamental analyst. And he says they, were, they went to one of those Chicago steakhouses, you know, the ones with the big steaks and huge knives, and the fundamental analyst is cutting his, cutting his steak, you know, cutting it a little too aggressively, apparently, and um, the snake knife flips out of his head, twirls in the air, and, and they're both watching and lands in his shoe. And Ed turns to the guy and he says, why didn't you move your foot? And the fundamentalist looks back and he says, well, I thought it was going back up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> you, get, you get the idea, cynicism, right? So, so what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to give you people here who are phenomenally successful using pure fundamental analysis on one hand and complete disdain for technical analysis and people who have been enormously successful using pure technical analysis and complete cynicism about fundamental analysis, right? So you, got to, you can't get further apart. It's got to tell you one thing. It's got to tell you there's no single way. There's no single uh, road. There's no single message. If you're looking for that, you, you haven't even got the right question, let alone the right answer. So I, 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 I'm going to quote myself. I don't quote myself very often, but I will for one time in this, in this talk. And in one of my books, I use the line because I think it applies to this. And it's, I said, there's a million ways to make money in the markets. And they're unfortunately all very difficult to find. But there are many, many ways. So the first thing to realize is you have to find a path and not to find the path. Okay, that leads us to the first principle. And, the first, and if you take nothing else out of this talk, if you just take this out of it, it will be worthwhile, I guarantee you. And that is every trader I ever interviewed, I could say this about. They found a method that fit their personality. Now, you know, some of you may say, well, well doesn't everybody do that? I mean, it seems logical. Wouldn't you trade your own? Well, no, you really wouldn't. Uh, think about it. And those of you who are traders, you probably could think of uh, examples right off the bat. But I've known certainly traders who may have been 
they may have had, let's say, a, a good knack analytically and could have done really well putting together some systematized approach and traded it, but no, too boring. Or no, they have to second guess it. Or no, they have to be more involved. Or it's too slow, or whatever. Or you have traders who are really good on the floor. They got the real instincts, but they get tired of all these uh, fellows up in the office trading 10 times as much as they are in all these markets, and they want to be one of those guys up in the fancy office and, and, and so on. And they go do that, and they become a mediocre trader off the floor. You constantly have people doing things which are not fitting to their personality. Now, let me illustrate what I mean by trading to fit your personality. Again, let's take specific examples, specific people. First, we'll take Paul Tudor Jones. Paul, one of the great future traders you know, of, of our time, um, and particularly in his initial years when he was managing small amounts of money, just had some incredible a decade, 10, 15 years of incredible performance. Uh, when I interviewed him, he said, um, come to my office at 2 o'clock. You know, and I said, I knew he's an active trader, so I said, well, Paul, you know, I can, I can come after the market close, no problem. He said, no, come 2 o'clock, it's fine. Okay, come to his office, big office, screens all the way across the walls. He's got speaker phones that directly connect to the floors. He's got regular phones. He's got people bringing him messages. He's yelling out, sell 300 March S&P, buy 500. All during the interviews, selling and buying, and, and people and phones are ringing, and everything's going on. He's looking at the screens, and he's doing the interview, okay? So I kind of say, like, like watching Paul, um, Paul trade is sort of like watching a professional tennis player on speed or something like that. I mean, it's just like really active and aggressive. That's Paul. That's his, uh, that's his, that's his style. That works for him. Let's take another picture. Gil Blake. Gil Blake is a mutual fund timer. When I interviewed him, he had a 12-year track record, average returns of about 45% per year, very steady. His worst year was like plus 35. His, uh, his worst was 30, plus 35. His best was about plus 55. Never lost more than 5% from a peak to a valley. Very, very consistent trader. What did he do? He actually, way interesting way he got into the, um, into the markets. He was, a, uh, he was a financial officer for a firm, knew nothing about trading or investing. And a friend of his came in one day and said, look, Gil, I found this. I've been timing mutual funds, and I've got this little pattern that I found, and it works. And Gil says, nonsense, you know, nothing that simple is going to work. Give it to me. And so he took the numbers, and he went over it, you know, and it, and it worked. He couldn't find anything that was really wrong with it. And that got him intrigued. Then he started really looking at it more closely, and he came up with patterns that were really much more effective. And he became so convinced that there was something there that he quit his job and became a, he became a trader, which led to the performance record I told you about. He would go to the library. He didn't even use a uh, computer to do his work. He would go to the library, go through, look through microfiche, look for all these mutual fund prices, and look for patterns, and just spend weeks in the library just flipping through these price patterns. Now, that was, and he'd go back and he'd be trading out of his one, uh, out of his bedroom at home, and that was his style. No other people, no other phones, no computers, nothing. That's Gil Blake. Now, could you picture, could you picture Gil Blake in Paul Tudor Jones's office? Could you picture Paul Tudor Jones and Gil, you know, going through the microfiche? I mean, it just is such a contrast. And if either one tried to do the other, they would absolutely fail. So you have to find a method that fits your personality. That message, by the way, also leads to an interesting tangential um, observation. And it's why most people will be doomed to fail uh, trading a system they bought. And if there are vendors here or systems, I apologize, but it's a reality. Now, why is that true? I don't know what percent of trading systems are profitable. Maybe, I'll grant, let's say, even more than 50% are. Let's just take that as an assumption. The trouble is this. Every trading system, I don't care what it is, is going to hit periods where it's not going to do well. Now, if you buy a system, particularly if it's a total black box, and you don't know what's in it, you didn't develop it, it has nothing to do with your personality, the first time that it hits a bad period, you're not going to have faith. You're going to lose it. You're going to drop it. And that's why invariably most people who buy systems end up losing because they will stop using it when it goes through a bad period. And it won't be there when it recovers. Again, it has to do with trading what, feel, what matches your personality. There is a uh, Wall Street adage that goes something along the line, even a poor trading system could make money with good money management. Have you heard that before? Have you got that? Okay, if you have that, forget it, because it's really one of the stupidest things that has ever been said. Okay, if you, now I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate that. If you believe that, then I invite you to go to Las Vegas and go over to a roulette wheel and, and 
Use your best money management system and see how far you get. And in fact, if you were to ask 100 mathematicians the following question, I'm going to play roulette, what betting strategy, what money management strategy is going to be optimize my results? They all should give you the same answer. You know what the answer is? You have, let's say you have $1,000, you walk over to the roulette wheel, pick red or black, put it all down, bet once, win or lose, walk away. Those are your highest odds. Now, yes, they're less than 50-50, but only a little bit. But the longer you play, the more your, your odds go down. So if you don't have, and here's the point, if you don't have the edge, good money management is actually the epitome of bad money management. You actually bet it all at once, because anything else you lose, you have a higher and higher probability of losing. So it's not enough to have money management. You actually do have to have an edge. And having an edge means that you have a method. No trader I ever interviewed, when I asked them, how do you do what you do, they all, some explain it actually very, very explicitly, some more generally, but they all have some specific type of approach. No trader ever said, well, you know, I wake up and I look at the screen and if bonds look good to me, I'll just buy them. I mean, nobody had a cavalier uh, shoot from the hip approach. They all had specific methodologies. That's essential to, uh, to a winning approach. The next thing we come to is the concept of hard work. It is amazing how, how, how workaholic-like these people are as a group. And I can give you lots of examples. In fact, most of the people would fall into the category. I'll take one example out of the most recent book, uh, and that's David Shaw, a uh, very secretive uh, fellow who uh, runs this uh, hedge fund, uh, which is a uh, statistical arbitrage, I guess, to put it into a category. What they're doing, essentially, <clears throat> and he's been running this fund now for about 13 years, with excellent, excellent results. Uh, and what they, what they do is they trade literally about 10 different world, all the major world markets. They're, they're monitoring all the equities, all the derivatives, and they're running about probably 20 different mathematical models simultaneously and looking for tiny mispricings, and it's all working interrelated uh, with, with tremendous computer power. He hires, he has scores of the best PhDs in mathematics and physicists, uh, and computer science working for him. It's an incredibly complex, sophisticated approach. I mean, extraordinarily so. You would think that monitoring this and, and supervising this and working on this would be enough, but no. David Shaw, over the years, has also been developing companies. Uh, probably one of the better, I mean, quite a number of them, uh, which he then spins off and sells. Probably the best known one is Juno, which is the website which he sold off. And he sold another one off to Merrill Lynch for their computer uh, trading uh, pro, uh, department and, and so on. And if that's not enough, he's got a hobby which is applying computer science to, uh, to, to, uh, to development of, of, of drugs. And so he's got two companies where he's involved heavily uh, in that. And he's reading all the periodicals in that, in that industry. And if that weren't enough, when Clinton was president, he was advisor to, to Clinton and he, ran, he, he was he chaired a committee on education and science. And they think, where does, and I asked him if he ever takes vacation. He says, well, well, not really. And if he does, he gets, after three hours, he has to go back to work. He just, that's, that's, that's David Shaw. And he says he's really kind of typical of the person that, get, that is really successful. Uh, and I said, there's really lots of types of, another, I'll give you another example. John Bender was an options trader I viewed in the last book. He would be trading options both in the U.S. markets and the, and the Japanese markets, and he would be up and trading and watching both of those markets. So, and they're completely different. They're 12 hours apart. They're, so, you know, you figure out when he sleeps and doesn't anything else. Okay, so that gives you kind of a flavor of what I mean by hard work. Now, the, the irony here is, why do most people get involved, or the general public, why is the general public attracted to markets and trading? Because it seems like an easy way to make a lot of money. And the irony is, the people who are really successful are, are tremendously hard workers, and people are attracted to the markets because they want to make money easy. That leads us to the following paradox. You'll grant me that no sane person would think of going into a bookstore, going to the medical book section, finding a book uh, titled How to Perform Brain Surgery, studying it, and going in Monday morning and believe that they could perform successful brain surgery. I mean, no, sa I said sane, no sane person would think that way, granted. However, how many people do you know who would think absolutely nothing unusual about going to a bookstore, walking to the business book section, buying a book called How I Made $2 Million in the Stock Market Last Year, 
and think that uh, after the weekend of reading this book, they can go in Monday morning and beat the professionals who have been doing it all their lives with all the support and all the experience they have. Right? I mean, it's really the same thing, but yet, yet most people have no, see nothing odd about the second, second uh, approach. Why such a contrast? What, you know, what's the answer? And there is an answer to the paradox, and the answer is this. Trading is probably the only world's profession where the rank amateur, the person that knows absolutely nothing, has a 50-50 chance of being right in the beginning. Why? Because there's only two things you can do. You could buy or you could sell. And some people are just going to get it right by probability, at least a few times in the beginning. And that beguiles people to think that trading's a lot easier than it is, because it is possible to get short-term success by pure luck. And that fools people. It absolutely fools people. Can't happen any other profession. You, you, you've never trained as a, as a surgeon. You, the odds of you getting up and doing brain surgery successfully are zero. You never played the violin. The odds of you getting up in front of the New York Philharmonic and playing a successful solo are zero. Any profession you take, the odds of even short-term success are zero. It just so happens trading has this quirk to it that you could be successful for the short term without knowing anything. And again, it fools people. That's, that's, that's the whole point. Uh, talked about trading being a lot of hard work. Now I'm going to tell you something that sounds contradictory. Good trading should be effortless. Right, so kind of, what, what is this guy talking about? First he says hard work, now I'm telling you effortless. Okay, here's the difference. The process, the, the preparation is where the hard work comes. The process should be effortless. I'll give you a running analogy. Let's say you picture, picture two runners here. They take, take, well, not two runners, but two people. On one hand, picture someone who's completely out of shape, try, try, never has done any exercise, trying to run one mile in 10 minutes. Okay, have that image? And picture, on the other hand, a world-class runner running one mile after the other, easy as can be, five-minute miles. Okay, who's doing more hard work? Who's more successful? Well, clearly the out-of-shape guy is doing more hard work. Clearly the world-class runner is more successful. But, but the thing is, the world-class runner didn't get there just by getting off the couch one day. He's been training all his life. So his hard work came into preparation. When he's performing successfully, however, the, process, the, the actual process, that has to be effortless. And when he's doing best, when he'll run his best race is when he's really running effortlessly. When, when somebody's, when you're writing or when you're an artist or what, anything that's creative, when you're doing it best, it's almost flowing. It's, it, it, in fact, it is a, that term flow is really actually a, a term that's come to be used. It's even the name of a book, which is a book actually worth reading. So, so and it's true, that is true of trading as well. If it's not going right, you can't force it right by more, working harder. If your trading is just not working, if you're, if you're in a, b a bad period, Trying harder, it'll probably make it worse. You can't try harder, you can't work harder. You can work harder in doing more research. You can work harder in trying to figure out what's going wrong, but you can't work harder at trading. You have to probably at that point just ease back, just, just maybe not trade, maybe trade less, because it's not effortless. And if when you're trading well, it's not work, it's effortless. Again, difference between preparation and process. And I'll give you, uh, there's an interview where this came up uh, with this exact point. And I have, you may, people wonder how I get some of these interviews, and it's not an easy sell, but one thing I usually have to do is I have to tell people, look, I, I, you know, I know there's nothing in it for you, but if you do the interview, I will show you the interview. I'm not going to use it. Uh, I'm not going to write anything that's untrue. I'm not going to sensationalize anything. And if you, if you don't agree with what I do, then you know, we, can't come, and we can't agree how to modify the interview, then we won't use it. And this kind of blows up in my face usually one time per book. You know, usually I'll have one interview, and I end up, in fact, it's happened, it's actually happened in all three Market Wizard books. There's been one interview that I couldn't use for exactly that reason. And so this, this pertains to one of those interviews. I'm not going to mention any names, but I finally, put, there was one thing in that interview that I really wanted to use, and I said, I said that, and the interview was one of these traders. Let me give you the background, at least, about what the interview is about. It was a very odd interview. This, this trader was into some unusual things. So in the interview, we, we got into uh, dreams and trading, precognition and trading, Zen and trading, you know, some pretty off-the-wall stuff. But it was an interesting interview. And I wrote it up, and I thought it was pretty good. I sent it to him, and a couple of weeks later, I get a call, and he says, I read the interview. And I said, uh-huh. And he said, um, it was interesting. I said, yeah. He said, but you can't use it. Said, Why not? Well, 
Turns out he had decided to also go into advising corporations on currency hedging. He had hired a business manager. His business manager read the interview. Business manager had all the stuff about it, dreams in trading and Zen in trading and whatever. Not the corporate image. His business manager said no. He said no, and I was stuck. So I said, look, do me a favor. Just let me use this one little section, and uh, we'll call it Trader X. And um, he said, okay. So that's why I have that two-page section in one of the books. And it goes, the conversation goes something like this. He says to me, uh, have you ever read Zen and the Art of Trading? And I say, well, I'm afraid I missed that one. And he says, no, I'm really serious. He says, just like in archery, whenever, and I'm going to quote him word for word, when, uh, trading, uh, the analogy between trading and archery, whenever there's any effort, force, straining, struggling, or trying, it's wrong. And if you trade, you know those words are true, word for word. Yeah, good trading has to be effortless. Okay, now we come to the concept, which this one is not going to be new to you, uh, but it certainly has to be uh, certainly important, and that is, of course, money management and risk control. So let me just tell you a couple of slants of how the traders look at it. The best way, of, uh, I think, the best summarization of it is Marty Schwartz. When he talks about trading and, and, and need for money management, he says you have to know your uncle point. I don't know if that uncle point is still a uncle that uh, term is still used. I know when I was a kid and we fought, you know, one kid bends the other kid's arm behind his back, he yell uncle. I don't know if kids do that. I don't think kids do that anymore today, but whatever. But that's what he, he has. You have to know where you yell uncle to the markets. That's his point. Bruce Kovner, who uh, at the time actually still a huge trader, uh, one of the most successful current, currency traders ever, um, taught, and takes huge, huge positions. I mean, when I was, even when I interviewed him, he was trading about a billion dollars. I don't know what he trades now, probably multiples of that. So he takes such large positions, he says, whenever I take a position, I know where I'm getting out before I get in. And he said, otherwise I couldn't, you know, I couldn't sleep. And, and, and the key point there is, by knowing where you get out before you get in, you make that decision when you have objectivity. Because once you're in the position, you lose that objectivity. And, and he basically decides where should the market not go if he's right and he decides that before he puts on a position. I think it's a very good way to operate. Now, money management doesn't have to be really complex. I know there's been books written out there on just on money management, and, and sometimes multiple volumes of money management. But you know what? A simple rule like risk no more than 1% on a trade will get you 90% of the way there. Most of money management is just doing it, just having the discipline to do it. It's not the complexity. There's nothing really, there's no rocket science that's required here. It's just that you have to have the discipline to do, which I'll get to in a minute. Now, as far as money management goes, there's some other slants I guess are worth mentioning. Uh, St uh, Steve Cohn, um, who's probably one of the world's best traders, uh, and he also hires other traders. And, and I interviewed him, he has like 50 other traders there. And so he's also not only trading himself, but he's monitoring other traders. He told me like the best trader that he has, the highest per win ratio was 63%. 63%. That's the highest one. And he says the point is that most people, you know, even good traders lose a large percentage of the time. And you have to be prepared for it. And he says if you're in a position and you're not sure what to do and it's going against you, he said cut it in half. And if you're still not sure, cut it in half again. And all of a sudden you're, you know, you're, you're down to a quarter of the position and, and the large part of the problem is gone. The point is just, just cut it in half will get you out of a lot of trouble in a situation, in a crisis situation like that. All right, now, now, now money management, uh, also, in this idea of volatility and risk control, it's, you know, we all here, uh, some of us are traders and some of us are investors. I guess we probably all are investors in some role. And in that, it's very important. It's a very important theme here, which relates to, to the investor side. And that is, a lot of people think about volatility when they're investing, whether, you know, they take higher risk investments, whether it's with a manager or with an individual equity or whatever it may be. And they'll say, oh, well, you know, I'm willing to take the higher volatility because I'll get that higher return. And I can take it. I'm tough. I don't mind the 30, 40% drawdown. If I can get that 50 or 60% return, I'll live through the 30, 40% drawdown. Well, you know what? They won't. I've been there. I mean, I've worked for brokerage firms uh, for over 20 years of my life. And I've, I've sometimes in a role of looking at managed accounts and analyzing what happens. And I can tell you at one time when I did the study at, at one brokerage firm, uh, when I was kind of working towards uh, picking different CTAs for the firm and, and monitoring them, I did a study where I looked at the results. There was a statistic that was reported, which was the percent of, uh, of investors who, who closed out their accounts at a profit. 
And I remember quite clearly seeing a number of times that the, the CTAs had less than 50% of their accounts closed profitably, even when they had all winning years. You know, think about that. That's because, you know, what are they doing? What are the investors doing? They're going in after the CTA has a good run, and then they're dumping it on a drawdown. People, people who say they can stand a 30% drawdown start sweating bullets at 10%. That's the reality, and you have to be aware of it. And the importance of that is that you won't be around, that investors are not around to get, even if the manager comes back or even if the investment comes back, they're not there to realize the gain. So that 50% return, that 60% return, it won't be there because what happens is people get out during the drawdown phase. And instead of a 50%, 60% return, they end up actually with a net loss in many cases. So that is the real danger of volatility. Now I'll give you a story that relates to that. Concerns a hedge fund manager who uh, unfortunately passes away. And, and the story starts with a, with a minister who precedes him. And the minister finds himself at the gates of heaven and uh, is met by St. Peter. And St. Peter uh, greets him and he says, Name. And he says, uh, uh, Reverend Charles Smith. And he looks it up and he says, Uh huh, hmm, okay. Tell you what, why don't you sit there? And the minister looks off to the side and there's this wooden bench. He's a little bit confused. He's expecting to go right in. He's, he says, oh, All right. And, and wanders over and sits down on the bench, and he sits there for a few hours. Up comes another man. St. Peter says, name? And the guy says, Robert Wilkinson. Robert Wilkinson, ah, oh, yes, I see. Uh, you're that New York heart surgeon. Sure, we've been expecting you. Please come right in. And the doctor goes in. A few hours pass, and the minister's watching along. Up comes another guy. St. Peter says, name? And the fellow says, Michael Murphy. Mm, Michael Murphy, you're the, you're the farmer from Iowa. Yeah, we were expecting you. Hope you enjoy your stay. We're delighted to have you. Please come right in. And the farmer goes in. Minister's watching, doesn't say anything, but he's growing, growing a little impatient here. A few hours more pass. Up comes another fellow. And St. Peter says, Name. And the person says, David Stevens. David Stevens. Ah, yes, the hedge fund manager from New York. Sure. I'm glad you're here. Please come in. All right. At this point, the minister's patience is gone. He walks up to St. Peter's. Okay, okay. The doctor, I got that. He saves lives. He goes in. Sure, I understand. Makes all the sense in the world. The farmer, all right, honorable profession, hard worker, helps feed people. I can understand that. He goes in. But the hedge fund manager, how come he waltzes and I get to sit on a hard bench? And St. Peter says, you know, I was trying to be tactful here. Didn't want to say anything. But the truth is, when you gave your sermons, your congregation slept. Up here we go by results. When he traded, his investors prayed. <laughs> okay. So you'll remember, you'll remember the importance of avoiding volatility. Okay, next, next, next theme is independence. should come as no surprise that these people who are very successful as traders are independent. Michael Marcus says it very well. He says, every trader has to follow their own light. He said, you can take the world's two best traders and put them together, and then you get the worst of both traders. And um, he's actually thinking of him, uh, he, when he's thinking of two good traders, he and Bruce Kovner worked together for a while, and uh, they were indeed two of the world's best traders. And he's saying, no matter how good the trader is, if you, if you try to combine method, methodology or try to combine opinions, you'll get, you'll get much worse results. And I can tell you um, my own experience. I'll, I'll tell you actually a, a true story that, that relates to this. Uh, and it's absolutely true because it sounds, when I tell you this, I, I, I know you're going to think that I'm maybe tweaking it a little bit to make it fit because it fits so perfectly. But I'll tell you, all the events are exactly as they occurred. And this was back uh, quite a number of years ago. I was trading my own, my own commodity account. And um, I had done okay, but in the last few months, I had actually had a poor period, and I was down money, and I had kind of cut back my positions. I had maybe one major position left. And, I, and there was one of the traders that I interviewed that would call me periodically. And uh, he calls me that day, and um, I'm not going to mention names who it is, but he, for whatever reason, he would want to know my opinion. I used to be a technical analyst as well, and he would like to know my opinions on the market. Maybe he was, he's much better trader than I was. Maybe he was fading me. I don't know. But uh, he just calls me for my opinion. So we go over the markets, and he gets to the Japanese yen. And that happened to be the one trade I had on that I had any confidence in. And uh, he says, well, what do you think about Japanese yen? He said, you know, well, I said, well. I said, you know, it's had this real sharp decline. 
and it's gone into this tiny nilla consolidation. And my experience is when you have that combined pattern, the market usually goes down again. And he says, no, no, you're wrong. And he, he gives me 80 reasons of why this oscillator is overdone, and this one's overdone, and this is, you know, this technical indicator this way. He gives me all these reasons why I'm wrong, and I say, you know what, you're probably right, but it's just an opinion. So I hang up the phone, and I, I'll tell you, even back then, this is like 10 years ago, I still, I was, I knew enough not to listen to anybody's opinion. But here's the thing, I had a trip out, I had to leave to Washington DC that afternoon, and I was going to be gone for a couple of days that I knew I couldn't watch the markets. That's my, so here's, here comes my rationalization. So I said, okay, I, I've been, not been doing so great lately, I've got one significant position left. Do I really want, I'm not going to be here to watch it, that's, that's the whole, <laughs> there's the rub, I'm not going to be here to watch it, that gave me my out. Do I really want to fade one of the world's best traders? So, after hours, the market's closed already because I didn't get out after I spoke to him, but I, afterwards I said, well, maybe I should get out. So I walk over to the after hours desk, I put in the order, I liquidate my position. Okay, I'm sure it's not going to be any surprise to anybody in this room. I come back a couple of days and he ends down 200 points. I mean, I'm sure you expected me to tell you that, and that's what happened. But here's where, where you have to believe me that this is exactly as it happened. Turns out he calls again that day. And I wasn't going to be so, so, <laughs> um, uh, go to the, let's say, uh, ask him directly, well, what about the yen? I, so we're talking, and he's going, he asks different markets. I don't raise the yen at all. Then he says, uh, he talks about the yen. Ah, yes, I said, I play dumb. I said, oh, yes, the yen, yen, yen. It, are, are you still long? And he exclaims over the phone, long? I'm short. What I didn't tell you is, he's a short-term trader. I mean, for him, a, a long-term trade might be a day. And for me, a short-term trade might be four weeks. So when he talked to me, he indeed was bullish. He was looking for a bounce. The market probably didn't act, they didn't act right. Uh, decided he was on the wrong side. Took his five-point profits. Went short. Made 200 points. I was right all along. Got nothing. The point is, if you listen to anybody's opinion, no matter how good they are, no matter how smart they are, I guarantee you it's going to blow up in your face. You just cannot get ahead by listening to other people's opinion. You have to generate your own ideas. Okay. Um, Next uh, question of um, confidence. I, w one thing about doing interviews, I don't know how you are to watch interview shows, but I'm one of these people, sometimes I, sw I kind of swivel in my chair because they don't ask the most obvious question. I don't know if you ever have that feeling, but I do. I mean, there's some exceptions. I think Ted Koppel is terrific and Charlie Rose, they ask the right questions. But you have a situation where, uh, where you're doing the interview, like I'm doing these books, I'm going to ask what I think is the most obvious question. If you were in my shoes, what would be the most obvious question that you might ask these traders? Now, I don't know what it would be to you, but for me, the most obvious question is, you made all this money. Why risk it? Why not just bank it, put in the bills, retire, go home, call it a day? I mean, it doesn't seem to make any sense to keep on doing it. And, and the answer I get, in one form or another, um, well, the best, let me give you just a, uh, one answer to this would be Paul Tudor Jones. He said, well, I, I keep 85% of my money in my own funds. Why? Why? Because it's the safest place for it. This is from a futures trader. So in his mind, keeping money in his own funds is safer than T-bills, I mean, or as safe as T-bills. What does that tell you? It tells you the guy has a lot of confidence. And Monroe Trout is, goes in one better. He puts 95 percent of the other money. And now that I'm running, you know, I'm running uh, uh, fund to funds, uh, and a lot of managers that I'm interviewing, they have 100 percent of the money. I mean, some one guy had like 100 percent plus his home equity. And I mean, these people have, <laughs> which is always good to know, you know, that these people have a lot of confidence in what they're doing. It's and, and, and which comes from? I mean, are they successful because of the confidence, or are they confident because of successful? It's kind of a hard answer, quick question to answer. But I can tell you this, that that. The one way to gauge it is, is whether you're going to be successful is whether you really have confidence. And often I'll peek, speak to traders and, and they, um, you know, trying to find a methodology or, or they're unsure. But I, I could tell them if you don't have, if you don't know that you have the confidence, if you're not sure or just about sure you're going to win, then you're not there yet. And you have to be aware and you have to go much more slowly. And only the per, only you as a, as the individual can decide or will know when you have the confidence. But I can tell you the traders are really good. They exude that confidence, and you just know it. Okay, related to confidence is this idea, and this is a little bit less, this is not so common. This is one of those ideas that, you know, you don't really hear, and it's very important to understand, and that is that losing is part of the game. Now, let me illustrate that with a comment by Linda Rashke, who's uh, some, uh, probably a lot of people in this room, more people in this room will know Linda Rashke, I think, than most audiences I speak to. 
But Linda Rashke has been, it was started out as, a, a, as an a options trader on the floor. Um, she had a horse riding accident and then ended up having to trade from an office and she became quite successful trading from an office. And she's done both, both of them quite, quite well. Linda said to me, it never bothers me to lose because I know I will always make it back. Never bothers me to lose because I know I will always make it right back. Now, does, does, doesn't that sound like an arrogant comment, an egotistical comment? But if you know Linda, she's a very modest person. She's very soft-spoken. She doesn't make anything about what she does. That's not her at all. All she's saying is this, I've got a methodology. It's going to win in the long run. Along the way, there are going to be some losses. As long as I stick with the methodology and keep doing what I'm doing, I'm going to come out ahead. If I lose now, I'll be win, win subsequently, and I will come out ahead. So that's all she's saying. She's saying that losing is part of the process, and you have to understand that. Dr. Van Tharp, who um, I interviewed in my first book and spent his career interviewing traders and counsels traders, and that's, that's, he's kind of doing a professionally what I did in my books, he had this comment about the traders he found most successful. He says, all successful traders that he, that he interviewed, the best ones, know they've won the game before they start. Now, if you know you won the game before you start, then there's no problem taking a loss because you understand that that's just part of the way of getting to the ultimate game. Uh, Marty Schwartz had a really interesting way of putting this whole, this whole concept about losing being part of the game. He said, what is the rallying cry of the losing trader? I'll get out when I'm even. Okay, think about it. Why is getting out even so important? Because if you get out even, you could say, I wasn't wrong, I didn't mistake, I didn't make a mistake. And that need not to be wrong, that, that need to fulfill the ego, to, to be right or not to have made a mistake, is exactly why people lose. So the irony is people lose because they don't want to lose or they don't want to take a loss. And the, real, and the professional traders understand that to win, they've got to take losses. That's part of the process. So that's why I say it's a very important uh, concept to understand. Losing is part of the, part of the game, it's part of the process. Uh, there's a Wall Street, there's a book uh, written about trading, probably the most famous book ever written about trading, uh, called Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, which many of you probably have read. Some people mistakenly think it's about Jesse Livermore, and it's written so realistically, and it's written in, in an autobiographical tone, that most people believe that the, the Jesse Lefebvre, who was the author, was really just, uh, was really, uh, Edwin Lefebvre was really Jesse Livermore, and it's a pseudonym. Uh, but in fact, there was a, uh, Edwin Lefevre, who was a journalist who wrote this book, and it wasn't just Jesse Livermore. Uh, he just did such a good job that people think it was Jesse Livermore. But in that book, there is a line that goes something like this. Um, it, it, it basically says that uh, uh, the, uh, there is the fool who does wrong uh, at all times, but then there is the Wall Street fool who, who thinks he must trade at all times. So it's roughly paraphrasing it. And the idea is... That, that you have to really wait for the opportunities. You just can't try to trade all the time. Jim Rogers has a good way of putting it. He says, I just wait until there's money lying there in the corner of the floor, and all I have to do is walk up and pick it up off the floor. You know, in other words, until something is so obvious, until a trade is so obvious that it's like taking money off the floor, he does nothing. What does that say? It says patience. Patience is essential to good trading. Uh, another trader... Had, the, uh, had this way of putting, t talking about patience. He said, uh, he used an animal analogy. He says, uh, the, first, the world's fastest animal is a cheetah. And, and, uh, but what will the cheetah do? It won't just go chase after any antelope. It'll wait in the bush for a week until it sees a baby antelope, and preferably a lame baby antelope, and then it'll strike. And he says, that's the epitome of a professional trader. So it's, again, waiting for the right opportunity. Now, closely related to patience and getting into a trade is the idea of patience and is, uh, staying in a trade. Uh, and it's what, going back again to reminiscence of a stock operator, he has an other quote. He says, it was never my thinking that made me the money. It was my sitting. Got that? My sitting. What he was saying was, look, it's not that I was a genius and was able to figure out all these great trades. But what I was good at is when I was in the right trade, I stayed with it and stayed with it and stayed with it. 
And that's why, that's where the prophets came from. That's what was essential. So it's what I would call the, the importance of sitting. And I go to a fellow by the name of Bill Eckhart who talks about this, uh, this subject. Eckhart may not be a, that familiar name. He was Richard Dennis. Everybody knows Richard Dennis. Eckhart was Richard Dennis's partner. And when you read about the turtles and, and, and the turtles uh, being trained and so forth, uh, it was both Dennis and Eckhart who trained the turtles. It wasn't just Dennis. And uh, Eckhart is a PhD mathematician. He's done quite well as a CTA over the years. And he talks about this, this, uh, this concept. He says... There's this adage, this Wall Street adage, that you never go broke taking a small profit. You know, probably have heard that one. And he said, that's a really wrong-headed approach. Amateurs, he says, go broke taking large losses. Professionals go broke taking small profits. The message is, whatever your methodology is and whatever represents long or short, you have to allow the good trades to work to their reasonable fruition if you want to pay for the losing trades. So again, the importance of patience both in getting in and getting out. Next we come to the subject of loyalty. <clears throat> now loyalty is a good trait, right? I mean, if you want loyalty in friends, family, pets, nice trait. As a trader, it's exactly the opposite of what you want. You don't want loyalty as a trader. Uh, the best example I can give you uh, concerns Stanley Druckenmiller. Stanley Druckenmiller, oh, and the date of this example, I'll give you the exact date. The exact date of this example is October 16th, 1987. October 16th, 1987. For those of you who are scrambling, I'll give you a hint. It's a Friday. Okay. On that day, Stanley Druckenmiller was, he was at the time, uh, Stanley, by the way, uh, probably you know Stanley, but he managed to, uh, he worked for George Soros for many years and uh, for many years ran the Quantum Fund. Uh, even though people associate the Quantum Fund with Soros, for, for a large part of that time, Soros was spending most of his time in East Europe and the Soviet Union. Uh, trying to get those countries over to capitalism and so forth. And the person who has really had his hands under control day in, day out was Stanley Druckenmiller. He's also run his own fund for 20 years and done terrific. And uh, before he went to Druckenmiller, he was, he was running multiple funds for Dreyfus. And this is at that time he was at Dreyfus. So he came in that day and he was net short. Nice position to be in October 16th, 1987. Unfortunately, if you remember, a lot of people think of where the market broke. They forget that the market was breaking sharply prior to that day prior to the Monday, and uh, particularly on Friday. Friday was, a, was a, uh, also a very ugly day. The market was down a lot, and he decided, you know what? It's kind of getting down 2,200, I think was, was the level it was coming down to. I think he, said that, he said, that's enough. The market's going to be near support. So he took his profits, but not only did he take his profits, he decided to go net short. I'm sorry, net long, net long. Now, I used to ask audiences, anybody here ever make a worse mistake than going from short to long on October 16th, 1987 in the U.S. stock market. Okay, I, the reason I stopped asking that question is because I realized I couldn't make up a worse example. I don't think you can make up a worse example. The, the amazing thing is, if you look at his record for that month, it'll be about break even. Now, how is that possible? Well, first of all, first half of the month he was short, so he made money. Now, here's the thing. After he put on a position on Friday, during the weekend, he decided he had made a mistake. He decided he was wrong. Why is, is we won't get into it, it's not important. You, won't, you know, you can read it in the book if you want to know why. But he was sure he was wrong. So he decided he was going to get out Monday morning. Unfortunately, Monday morning comes around and, and the Dow opens over 200 points down to begin with. But what he did that, that Monday morning was in that first hour of trading, he covered his entire position and get this, he went back short. Now think of the amazing flexibility and then we're talking about fellow managing, I guess, probably over a billion dollars at the time, to be able to reverse his position again after, after the market has gone down that much overnight. That's a tremendous flexibility, tremendous lack of loyalty. It's a classic example of a professional trader. So as, as a, if you want to be a good trader, you can't have loyalty to your position. There's no hoping, there's no, there's no anything. You've got to be able to react immediately. You can't have loyalty to your position. There's, uh, we'll, we'll come down, we'll have a couple of last points before we finish. I guess we're just about done. Uh, la uh, one other point I would like to make, uh, which, which is uh, a point that going back to Eckhart, and has to do about people's human nature, human nature in trading. 
And, and Bill Eckhart has an has a interesting comment. He says that people are so, so poorly attuned to trading that they will do worse than random. Now, you know the uh, academic comments, you know, the academic, now you'll see the academic say, well, you can take a monkey and give him darts and put up a page of the Wall Street Journal, let the monkey throw darts, and the monkey will do as well as the professional money managers. Okay, you've all heard something like that, I'm sure. Now, Bill Eckhart, so there's no confusion here, Bill Eckhart is not saying that. He's not saying the monkey's going to do as well as the professional money managers. He's saying the monkey's going to do better. <laughs> That's an important distinction. Now, why is the, mon why is the monkey going to do better? The monkey's going to do better because humans have evolved in such a way that they are particularly poorly attuned to trade. Humans seek comfort, whether it's food or shelter or sex or whatever, it's comfort. And you know what? Markets don't pay off for being comfortable. His point is markets pay off for being uncomfortable, for taking the uncomfortable position. And most people don't do that. They seek comfort in, the, in their trading as well. And that's why he says they're going to do worse than random, that you would literally, for most people, would literally make better choices if they threw darts. And, and examples, examples of uh, easy to find. Look, if you're in a position that's going against you, let's say, and, uh, and, and you say, oh, well, I'll, I'll get out, but I'll give it another three days. You know, oh, good, I got another chance. Feels good. It's usually the wrong decision. Or, or you're going to buy some stock or whatever, and it's... Uh, and um, you, 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 you're buying it, let's say, at a lowest point it's been in the last six months. Kind of feels good because you're smarter than everybody else who bought that stock in the last six months. So it's, it, yeah, boy, aren't you smart. You've got the best buy in the last six months. Feels comfortable. So a lot of these trades that are done, which come out of a, 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 an emotion of seeking comfort when you get right down to it, are going to end up being wrong. It's also, by the way, what, what, it, for those of you involved in trading systems, this leads a lot of people to go wrong in developing trading systems. Because what do people do with trading systems? They, they will optimize and optimize and optimize until you get a really smooth curve. Now, doesn't that feel good to trade? Boy, you've got a curve here that's never lost in any given month. And that feels a lot better to trade than some trading system that has some wiggles to it. And the more you optimize, the smoother you get it. But the more you optimize, the greater the chances the system won't work at all. But again, it's part of this human nature seeking comfort. So we'll finish off this by um, just, uh, I mean, I always, uh, well, one last point and then one last story. The last point is look at the language of traders. They talk about, I've heard a description of talking about trading as a three-dimensional chess game, as Bruce Kovner's line. Uh, Jim Rogers talks about 10,000, it's like a jigsaw puzzle of 10,000 pieces, and they're always throwing in new pieces, taking out some pieces and throwing in new pieces. Um, another trader talked about trading being like a chart, his chart book. He passed his chart book. He says, it's like a treasure hunt. He says, every week I, I go through this and I look for new treasure. And what are those? Those are all game-like analogies. And that tells you something. It tells you that to them, it, trading is almost like a game. It's something that's fun and something they love to do. And that's the essence of it. Whether it's trading or anything else, I guarantee you, look around people in your life who are successful. And the one thing I'm sure of is they love what they're doing. It's true of trading, it's true of anything. And unless you have that, that love and passion, you're not going to be successful, and it's essential to be, to be successful. So we finish off by, I finish off the last story, which is just a personal thing, which I, I've given this talk, I really have given this talk a lot of times. I used to give talks on lots of different stuff, even fundamental analysis at one point, and uh, certainly a lot of stuff on technical analysis and uh, uh, computer trading and all that stuff. But basically now, almost all the time, I'm giving talks on on market wizards and this, this particular theme we just discussed. And there's a story which I like to talk about, um, which is about an economist uh, who is in a similar situation as I am, and he's being driven to give a talk to uh, an international audience, and he's being driven by a chauffeur, and he's in the back of the car, and he kind of sits there and he moans, and the chauffeur asks him, uh, sir, what's wrong? And the economist said, oh, you know, I can't stand to give this talk again. I, I must have given this talk 200 times. I I'm just bored to death of it. And the chauffeur says, you know what, no problem, boss, I'll, I'll give the talk for you. And, and, and the economist says, well, how could you give this talk? This is a highly technical, sophisticated talk, and the orange is filled with all these PhD uh, economists. He says, boss, I've heard you give this talk 200 times. I know it word for word, trust me. And he figures, what do I got to lose? So they switch, he puts on the chauffeur's uniform, the chauffeur puts on his suit. The chauffeur gets up in front of this audience of economists, and he gives the talk for an hour, he delivers it perfectly. But then he gets carried away. And he finishes his talk and he says, <clears throat> any questions?
<laughs> and he gets a question, and he actually manages, and then he gets another question, and he does okay. Then he gets a question, and the fellow, <clears throat> I was very intrigued about your theory of synthesizing classical Keynesianism with monetaristic theory. My question is this. If you put it into the standard econometric framework, do you treat the monetary variables as exogenous or endogenous to the model? <laughs> Schofer scratches his head, and he says, you know, I've given this talk 200 times, and that has got to be the single stupidest, dumbest, most ridiculous question I've ever heard. In fact, it is so dumb, I'm glad my chauffeur answered. <laughs> <laughs>